Amen. Thank you, worship team, for, yeah, yeah. Good morning, Grace. It is good to be with you this morning. I'm preaching from an iPad today because I really want to be like Pastor Stephen, so we're going we're gonna to try it out and see how it goes. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence this morning. And Lord, may we not get caught up in the distractions or the temptations of this world, but just listen to you. And may that be done here, that it is your voice and not mine, that we may leave differently than we came in. So Lord, thank you for the blessings that you just continue to pour on this place and to each one of us. May we always be thankful and grateful for it. In your name we pray. Amen. Pastor Stephen is actually not here today. Him and his wonderful family are visiting their home church, and so I'm glad that they get to just have time where um, it was such a formative time in their life, so that's where they're at. And so he asked me um, if I could, you know, hold the fort down, and I said, yeah, I'll try not to burn the place down. He said, well, hey, if the Lord sends the fire, mine as well. So I said, hey, you got a point, so we'll see what happens, right? Um, it's been a while since I last preached, and so it is good to be back. Uh, he, Pastor Stephen wants to take one more week off of our Corinthian series. Um, we will be back next week with that, 1 Corinthians, power and love, wisdom for 1 Corinthians. And so today, I want to continue with the theme that we've kind of been going these past two weeks, and this will be the third, of comfort. <clears throat> and so I've titled today's sermon, Fix Your Eyes. Fix Your Eyes. And to start, I want you to fix your eyes on this picture that I'm about to have up on the screen. I'm going to have a couple of pictures actually throughout today's sermon, so get ready. If you are a sports fan, or more specifically a basketball fan, you know whose shoes these are. As a matter of fact, you don't even necessarily need to be a basketball or a sports fan and kind of know whose shoes these are. These are the great Stephen Curry's basketball shoes. Arguably the best shooter in the NBA of all time. And there's multiple ways you can tell that these are his shoes. There's the colors of his, the colors of his shoes. Those are Golden State colors. There's the brand Under Armour. That's kind of his brand. There's the small SC in the corner of the shoe that stands for Stephen Curry. But also, if you can also see, he has a Bible verse, and it says, I can do all things. This is Curry's signature Bible verse that he puts on all of his shoes. I can do all things, and I bet most of you could finish that verse. Ready? I can do all things. Exactly. I was right. However, if I were to also bet and guess, I bet that many of us couldn't quote the couple of verses right before it. They were leading up to it. And so today I want you to meet me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4, starting with verse 10 all the way through 13. And once you are there, please stand on your feet. Starting at verse 10, this is what it says. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Now that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how how to abound. In and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You may be seated. Now, if you were to ask me, this verse is one of the most commonly quoted, cliche, misused Bible verse of all time. And if I were to read Philippians 4.13 just by itself and apply it to my life, like most people do, most professional athletes do, I would stand up here and say, with Christ on my side, I can do absolutely anything. Bench 350, easy. 
Climb Mount Everest? No problem. Marathons? Back to back? Why not? Let's do it, right? But that's such a bad interpretation. And so I want to just do some simple exegetical work right here. First, let's look at the reason why Paul wrote the book of Philippians. While he was in prison, by the way, he wrote it to, one, thank the church in Philippi about the gifts that they had given them, but also to deal with the ongoing problem of persecution. People were being slain for their their faith left and right. That's why the main theme of the book is suffering. Then let's look at the verse itself. It says, I can do all things. You ever wonder what all things even means? Uh, Like, I can do all things. What is all things he's referring to? Bench the 350? Run the two marathons back to back? Lead the Bears to the Super Bowl? (laughs) Maybe I went a little too far with that one. I don't know about that one. Yikes. Yikes. I don't know if that's happening. Of course not. That's not what all things is referring to. All things refers to the list of problems Paul lists off the very verses before it. Being in need, brought low, hungry, thirsty, having plenty, having abundant, but also having nothing. All things are referring to everything that has happened to Paul in his life, which at that point in time is a darn lot. Paul is saying, oh, I know what it's like to fill in the blank. And this is where I think he really connects with us more than ever. I know what it's like to be poor. I know what it's like to be well off. I know what it's like to be healthy. I know what it's like to be gripping for my life. I know what it's like to have status and authority. I know what it's like to be hated and mocked. I know what it's like to have friends and family by my side. I know what it's like to feel like I have nobody by my side and I'm all alone. Paul says, I know. I know what it's like. But no matter what, no matter what, I'm going to be content in whatever circumstance that comes my way. No matter where I'm at in life, I'm going to be okay. How, Paul? Tell us how. That's when in comes the famous verse 13. It's because Christ is the one who provides him strength to get through it. This verse is often linked to success, but in reality, it really needs to be linked to sustainability. That with Christ... I won't always be successful. With Christ, life is not always going to be great. Life is going to have its way with me sometimes. Oh, but I'm going to be sustained. And so I actually just want to park the sermon here for a second. Before we even go anywhere, I want to park it right here. And can we just seriously praise God for a minute? Can we seriously, if you're able to right now, I want you to actually stand on your feet and let's give God some glory, right? I I think it's important that we do that. Keep going. It's important that we take our focus off of our failures in life. It's important that we take our focus off of the valleys that we may be in life. Keep it going. Because God has already brought you through them. And so can we just take a minute to acknowledge that God is your sustainer. That throughout your life, God may have not given you success. He may not have given you whatever it may you have been wanted. He may have said no to you sometimes in prayer. And that's okay. Because he has sustained you through the lows of life. That business you poured all your money into that didn't work out. That job that didn't work out. That relationship that didn't work out. That medical treatment that you thought was going to work out, but it didn't work out. That schooling that didn't work out. That house bid that you really wanted that didn't work out. That sickness that almost got you. That wayward child that isn't home yet. Those feelings of doubt, anxiety, loneliness, and that just plague you sometimes. That accident that happened to you so many years ago that still plagues you with aches and pains today. Yet you're still standing. Yet you are still standing because God has gotten you through it. Yet you are still standing with joy in your heart because God who sustains continues to sustain you through it all. 
We have a God who gives strength to the weak. A God who provides peace in times of unrest. A God who doesn't just sit up there saying, good luck to you, but provides ways. Maybe they're big or maybe they're small and you don't even see them sometimes. But he provides ways through it. He provides ways that you can just keep moving forward. In which ways we can just shout and say, thank you, Lord. Amen. You can maybe be seated. Now... I could be done. Pastor Stephen isn't here. We could pack it up and go home. <laughs> Ten minutes? Cool. But I'm not going to do that. I even get to my main point yet. I want to take the reminder, remainder of this time to go a step farther and examine our focus. Because it's in our focus that I think leads us to a place where Paul is writing at while writing this. And so it's one thing to say, I have the strength to be content, but how do we actually obtain that strength? And I think it has to do with our focus. It can be very easy to focus on all the things that are going bad in life. It can be super easy to look at all the hardships, or maybe even not. Maybe for some of you, life is great right now, and great But even with that, it's super easy to lock your eyes on everything else that the world has to offer. The world is loud. Amen? The world is loud. There's an election coming up, or so I'm told. I haven't heard much about it. It's been pretty quiet, right? But, you know, there's a lot going on. And so I think it's in our focus that either leads us to a Philippians 4.13 type of attitude or away from it. And so I want to emphasize the one point I have for us today, just one. And I want to showcase it by telling two stories. Two stories from the same person's life. How many of us know David from the Bible? Okay, quite a few. He's a pretty famous character. He's a pretty important figure in the Bible. And so the first begins in Psalms 27. And I'm going to share two of his moments. One of his moments in Psalm 27 were his, his greatest moment. A moment of great faith for David. And then I'm going to share a moment of David's wasn't that great. And so starting with Psalm 27, with the first four verses, it's going to be up on the screen. It says this. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies of my foes, come upon me to eat me, to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. I want to pause here for a moment. I just think this is really funny because like David writes this, like he's trying to be relatable to us. You know, you guys get it when your enemies are trying to come inside your home and eat you, right? Yeah, okay, David, we know exactly what you're talking about. Right, sure. Can continue. So he's in his castle with his enemies around him, trying to eat him. Cool. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this I will be confident. What, David? What are you going to be confident in? The armies that you have or the armies that you have collected or the power and authority and status you have? Because that would be a good thing to be confident in, right? Verse 4, one thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. This part of David's life, we see a strong David. We see a courageous and faithful David, a mountaintop type of David, a I'll fight anybody and come out on top David, a version of David that can do absolutely anything, a literal reading of Philippians 4.13 kind of David. How? Why? It's simple. Look at what he beholds. The word behold means to see or observe. And in verse 4, what does he behold? He beholds the beauty of the Lord. David at this moment in time with cannibals around him, his enemies around him trying to see him fall, fail, and die, 
instead of being afraid or tired or scared or sick or whatever, fill in the blank word, he is overjoyed. And he is ready because he is observing and has, and has had his eyes set upon the beauty and awesomeness of our God. This is when David is winning. This is when David's strong. However, David wasn't always winning. How many of us know that? How many of us know that David had his oopsie-daisy kind of moments, right? And so the second story comes in. When David is at home lounging around his palace, many of you know the story of David. Everyone else is out to war. And that's already a bad thing. Everyone else is out to war and he's at home. He should be out there with his men. He's not. So something is already wrong. He's already taking his focus off the wrong thing. And so he's at home. And he wanders out into his balcony. And he ironically sees a woman bathing named Bathsheba. What in the world? My mind still can't get wrapped around the fact that there was a woman named Bathsheba bathing. It's crazy to me. The odds of that happening just crazy. He then calls for her. He sleeps with her. He impregnates her. And then realizes she is married. And then on top of that, she, he realizes her hunk of a husband is now coming home. Uh-oh. So now... He orders him to be sent to the front lines of battle where he dies. You can't make this stuff up. You can't do it. You want real good reality TV? Skip keeping up with the Kardashians. Open up your Old Testament. This story ends up, this story of David ends up with murder, adultery, betrayal, and just an absolute mess. An absolute mess. But I want us to look at this part of David's life because it's eerie similar to the very first one. His story here is found in 2 Samuel 11 too. It's also up on the screen, and this is what it says. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to what? Behold. Hmm. So one of David's greatest faith moments, he's beholding the Lord. And then in one of David's greatest failure moments, he is beholding things other than the Lord. And I bring this all up. I bring Philippians 4.13. I bring David's two moments. I bring up the word even just beholding because of this. This is my main point today. Here it is. The trajectory of your life is dependent on where you fix your eyes. You want contentment? You want joy? You want to feel sustained? What are you looking at? Desperation? Fear? Loneliness? What are you looking at? Every single one of us in this room is beholding something. Every single person has their eyes fixed upon something. What is it? What is it that you are beholding? And so I have two categories that I think we are guilty of. The first being this, things that distract us. Things that distract us. And what I mean by this are not the sinful things. These aren't the evil, sinful, bad things. These are just things that we're not meant to behold all the days and hours of our life. I think food is a great example. Food's not evil. We need food to survive. Food isn't sinful, but it can lead to it. Or a better example, social media. Did you know that the average American spends two hours and 34 minutes on social media a day? Some of you may be like, that's it? Oof, I'm above average on that one. <laughs> two hours and 34 minutes on social media a day. We go on Facebook, we go on Instagram, or whatever it may be, for escape. But most of the time, we end up going on it to escape, but then end up getting mad at everything that we see on it. TV shows, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, HBO Max, Disney Plus, Peacock, I could go on and on, right? 
We light our faces up with the screens of our TVs, of our phones, rather than lighting up our face of the scripture. Some of us say we don't have time, but yet binge watch Netflix or go on social media for two and a half hours. And again, I'm not saying these things are wrong, please, because I would be a hypocrite. I love a good Netflix show. Trust me. I love a good funny Instagram post. It it makes me laugh a lot. And I eat good food up. I love good food. But what I'm saying is we often treat these fun and good things like God's. And so show me what you spend most of your time doing, and I'm going to show you what you value most in the world. And more often than not, you know where all this stuff leads to? A lack of value and a lack of awareness of our God. We start to think, oh, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not fit enough. I'm not athletic enough. I'm not funny enough. I'm not famous enough. And it catapults our life down a road of doubt, fear, anxiety. We lose our sense of purpose. Our problems become bigger than God. And that I can do anything type of attitude becomes more like I can't do anything type of attitude. I think fireworks are a great example Fireworks, they're big and bright and they're really cool and they shoot up into the sky and they're really pretty and we have a whole holiday that we we celebrate by shooting them off, right? Like, fireworks are great when they're used for the right purpose, when they get shot up in the air. What happens when the firework maybe isn't shooting up but then falls flat and is now shooting at you? That cool and good and awesome thing now is coming at you and you're scattering around. The moment something on this earth, even if it's not necessarily bad, becomes our focus, it often brings danger and brokenness. So things that distract you. And the second thing that I think we often put our focus in is this. Things that destroy you. This is the sin. This is the worry. This is the fear. This is our past even. This is the circumstances you're in. This is the hardships you may be in. Things that destroy us. The, sin, the, the thing about sin is this. It's always going to try to convince you it's what you need. Sin is always going to try to convince you it's the answer to whatever emptiness that you may have. I mean, look at David for crying out loud. David. He had everything. King David had everything he could ever want. Yet he looks upon Bathsheba and says... I don't think I have that yet. We run around going from one thing to the next, the gossip, the pride, the ego boosters, the drugs, the earthly pleasures, because we think it's going to give us meaning when in reality it just makes us dizzy because we're constantly running from one thing to the next. And some of us don't want to admit that. Some of us don't want to admit the emptiness that we feel after these things. Because then we're being vulnerable, and we're not about that. There's our past. Many of us are walking and trying to do life without even looking forward. Because you're so concentrated in where you have been, or what you have done, or maybe what's been done to you. And so I bring my point up again. The trajectory of your life is dependent on where you fix your eyes. And if you're looking back, you're definitely not moving forward. Or better yet, you're probably moving forward, but you're fumbling and hurting so much because you're so concentrated on looking back. Or maybe it's just your circumstances, the hardships, the situations you find yourself in. The hardships of life, they can catch your attention very quickly. And we can get so caught up in them. We can get so caught up in the situations rather than locking your eyes on God who can get you through the situation. And so Paul wrote Philippians 4.13 because he wasn't looking at his situation. He was in jail at that time. Paul was able to write Philippians 4.13 saying, I can do anything because he was beholding the power of God. And this is where it connects. This is the key to obtaining this contentment, this joy, when you have nothing or when you're going through it or when you're in the valleys of life. It's because you're not looking at the valley you're in. You're looking at Christ. And so are you constantly looking at all the problems around you? Or are you looking at the one who's going to get you through the problems? 
And so here is my last thing, Hebrews 12, 2. We need to fix our eyes upon Jesus. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so what happens when you start to behold Jesus? There's this confidence like David in Psalm 27. That mountaintop type of David that rises up when you're starting to behold the power and awesomeness of our God. The contentment and joy and resilience in Philippians 4.13 starts to take place. But for some of us, for some of us, we've been in the church a long time. And maybe for some of us, we've never really felt that. We've never really felt that, that confidence or that, or that power or that when you're, when you're looking at Jesus, you, you've, you still are just kind of, ah. Uh. I have an illustration. And so there's going to be a couple of pictures up on the screen. And here's the first one. Some of my students are here. I gave them this illustration, so don't say anything. What do you guys think this is? Dirt, sand, okay, yeah. No, this is, this is the Great Pyramids. Cool. Uh, next picture. What do you guys think this is? Iceland? No, this is the Northern Lights. Okay, cool. Third, third picture. What do you think this is? Grace, Grace Church, okay. What else, any, any others? A brick wall? No, this is the Great Wall of China, okay? I want you to imagine that I'm talking to you. We're having a conversation, and I tell you, yeah, I've seen the Northern Lights. Not impressed. Yeah, I've been to the pyramids. Yeah. And you know what? I've actually been to the Great Wall of China. Wasn't that great. And then I show you these pictures. And I say, see, I've been there. I have proof. You would look at me like, what? I may have been standing in the place that I have had access to see something beautiful. But I was looking still in the wrong place. And I feel like there are some of us that are tempted to give up on Jesus. Jesus who are tempted to just walk on, on, uh, on God because this just isn't working. I don't feel that extravagant beauty or awesomeness. You've gone to church. You've gone to Bible studies. You've done all the things Christians are supposed to do, but I'm telling you there's a difference. There is a difference between standing in a place where you have access to him versus actually looking at him until something starts to shift on the inside of you. Because no one can truly look at the northern lights and say, not impressed. That picture was Iceland. It was one of the points where you can see the northern lights. It was supposed to be beautiful. No one can truly look at the northern lights and say, not impressed. Nobody can truly look at the pyramids and say, meh. Nobody can truly look at the Great Wall of China and say, it's not that great. And the same thing goes for Jesus. Nobody can truly look at Jesus, really look at him and say, nah, not impressed. Because he is greater than anything you could ever experience. He is greater than the sin that you have faced. He is greater than any earthly pleasure you've experienced. He is greater than any hardship you are going through. Jesus who in this Hebrews verse says the joy set before him, he endured the cross, that torturous and humiliating death by crucifixion was right there in front of Jesus' eyes. The pain of the lashes, the mockery, the tissue in his muscles just ripping apart while he hung up there. The scoffing at as people would walk by and look upon these people on the cross the suffocation and his lungs filling up with blood, the shame and the death was right there. He saw it all. He saw that that was in front of him. And he not only knew that, he not only knew that that was in front of him, he not only knew what laid ahead of him, he not only knew what type of death was about to hit him, 
He went through with it with joy and love. Not grumbling, not complaining, but with joy and with strength. How? Why? Because of what he was beholding. He was beholding us so we can behold him. His vision and his love was set upon us so that we can be set upon him. His love for us was greater than any type of pain he could ever experience. And so I'll say it again. The trajectory of your life is dependent on where you fix your eyes. Brothers and sisters, we need to make it the mission of your life. Saturate your life with Jesus. Pray, read, fast, sing, worship, fall on your knees, sing in your car. Whatever you need to do, make Jesus your focus. Behold Jesus, because while on the cross, he was beholding you. And so as the worship team comes up, I want to give you all the opportunity to change your focus right here, right now. Take the first steps at shifting and putting your life's purpose in the hands of Jesus rather than the things of this world. And rather than waiting for tomorrow or the next day or the day after, because those days are not promised to you. Today, right now, you can do that. You want to be redeemed of your sins. You want that blood that still has that same power as it did when it was beaten out of him. You want that redeeming blood. I ask that you pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus Christ, for too long I've kept you out of my life. I know that I am a sinner and that I cannot save myself. No longer will I close the door when I hear you knocking. So by faith, I gratefully receive your gift of salvation. I am ready to trust you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming to earth. I believe you are the Son of God who died on the cross for my sins and rose from the dead on the third day. Thank you for bearing my sins and giving me the gift of eternal life. I believe your words are true. Come into my heart my heart, Lord Jesus, and be my Savior. Amen.